Matthew Berger, great to see you. Thank you so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your home in South Africa. I know you guys are heading into midwinter down there, but uh, what are the temperatures like there lately? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, temperatures right now are actually really nice. Um, we don't have winters like most of the world. Our winters uh, stay pretty warm compared to some places we don't get snow. The temperatures range uh, in, a, in the day about 15, 16, 17 degrees Celsius, which is about 60 or so Fahrenheit. So relatively warm for winter at least. And during the night, it can go down to about one, two degrees, which is about 30 to 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So really nice temperatures all around. Great weather down here. We love it. Oh, you're lucky. Now, of course, we know each other from our Instagram accounts. And of course, you're well known in the world of paleoanthropology as the son of scientist Lee Berger, who in very recent years discovered not only a new species of Australopithecus, but a genus Homo as well. Uh, you had quite a significant role in both those finds, as we will talk about soon. You're currently in, in university, the University of Alabama. So what is it you're studying? Is it anything along the same lines of paleoanthropology? Yeah, so I am currently double majoring in anthropology, geology, and minoring in criminal justice. Um, definitely along the lines of paleoanthropology because paleoanthropology is a subfield of anthropology. Um, the geology goes along with the fossils and rock type area. And then the criminal justice I added on just because I'm also pretty interested in forensic anthropology. So maybe there might be something along the way there, but definitely very related to paleoanthropology at the moment. You've posted a lot of amazing pictures on your Instagram account lately of you traveling around the world, uh, 11 countries in total uh, that you visited, I believe. This was part of the university study abroad program, the Semester at Sea. So can you tell us a little bit about that and if it inspired you in any way? Because I'm, I'm assuming it did. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, the program's called Semester at Sea. It's run by Colorado State University, but anyone around the world can do it. Um, it's basically a cruise ship with about 600 students on it that travels around the world for a semester and you take actual college uh, credit classes on the ship and then um, you get free roam of the country basically, um, whichever country you're visiting. And so I visited 11 different countries and it was probably, I, I say this with all my heart, some of the, or probably the best four months of my life. There's honestly no words to describe the whole experience to someone that actually hasn't really done it, but we got to meet amazing people, as I said, 600 other students, got to travel the world while getting college, uh, college credit, and it was an unbelievable experience. It changed my life and definitely inspired me um, because you got to see so many different cultures around the world, and it was very cool because the trip I did, we went to a lot of Southeast Asia countries and so places you wouldn't necessarily go by yourself. So it was very cool to immerse myself in that culture and get involved with that and actually see from their perspective what that was like. So definitely inspired me in a lot of ways to um, help the earth because we also got to see um, the world from the ocean for 106 mm. days. So uh, stuff like plastic pollution being a problem, uh, it really helped to inspire me to start promoting, um, stop stopping the use of plastics and actually saving the planet because um, as a lot of people know, our planet is not going to survive long with us on it if we keep doing what we're doing. Oh, that's brilliant. I hope we can see uh, some more of that on your Instagram soon. It's a really good shot you've taken, by the way. I, I suggest anyone to uh, have a look at follow you. So is it okay if we have your Instagram account, account and Twitter and so forth in the description yeah, below? Go ahead, right, yeah. Okay, great. Right, let's get on to the first of your dad's discoveries, which was actually your discovery, the two million year old hominid known as Australopithecus sediba. Now this was in 2008, you were nine years old at the time, exploring a place called Malapa, not too far from where you live in uh, now in South Africa. Now this was a pretty amazing day for you, but it started out as a fairly ordinary day, isn't that right? Yeah, so growing up my whole life, I had been exploring with my father. Um, I'd been out and about in the cradle of humankind looking for fossils, but also just to be out there. I was a hugely outdoorsy kid, so I just loved being out there. 
Um, so whenever I had the chance, I would go with them. And from an early age, as long as I can remember, I'd always been going out there to um, just explore and adventure with them. Uh, I was nine years old at the time, and this was in 2008. And about two weeks earlier, my dad had found um, this hole in the ground, you could call it, uh, which we later named Malapa. And he, when he had found it, he had noticed an antelope fossil leading up to it just to the side. So that obviously sparked some interest because there were fossils there, that man. So he took it down and then carried on looking for more caves. And so then two weeks later, him, myself, his colleague Joe Kibby and our dog, because our dog would always just come to explore with us out there. Um, we returned to the site and we climbed through barbed wire fences to get to this and followed an old miners track up to the hole. And we got to the hole and my dad said, Matt, go look for fossils. Because he knew that I knew what I was looking for and what I needed to find, but I was also there just to be outdoors and have fun. So I ran off um, away from the site, following my dog um, Tao down a animal path, you could call it. And as I was running behind him, there was a tree root or log in the middle of the um, animal path and I tripped over this. And so as I was getting myself up, dusting myself off, I noticed a small, what people would just see as a white speck in a rock. I knew it as a fossil um, because I'd been looking for them my whole life. So I knew how to identify the difference between a fossil and limestone. And so I picked up this rock, kind of looked at it and thought, oh, cool. Okay. I just found another fossil. Didn't really think too much about it. Called my dad over and he was very reluctant to come because he said he knew what I'd found already. I'd found an antelope fossil because just to put it into perspective, for every one hominid fossil we find, we find 250,000 antelope fossils. So that's quite a lot. So he knew right away what I'd found because that's all we ever found. So as he started walking towards me and about five meters away, he stopped dead in his tracks and started swearing. Um, he claims he didn't, but I definitely remember he did. And um, so obviously my dad was swearing towards me. So I thought I'd done something wrong. So I said, what, what did I do wrong? He's like, nothing, nothing. You found a hominid fossil. This was huge for him at the time. Him and Joe started celebrating. Um, I really didn't understand too much about it at the time. But um, a reason he actually knew what it was um, and why he stopped five meters away from me is because um, at the time he was probably the only world's expert on hominid on the hominid shoulder region because he had done his PhD on it. And the fossil that I was holding was the clavicle, which is the collarbone um, of a hominid. And so being probably the only world expert at the time, he could tell right away that it was hominid. And um, so that's why he didn't even have to come take a closer look. Wow. He did eventually come and take a closer look. Um, and as we were holding the block and looking at it, we turned it over to get a better look. And sticking out the back was a hominid mandible with teeth sticking out. That's when we knew this was a huge discovery because you usually only find fragments of hominids. You don't find one or more pieces and teeth in one single block. This was huge. Um, so they started celebrating. As I said, I didn't really understand it too much, but I knew it was huge because my dad and his colleague were hugely excited. We called for permission to take this block off the site and um, because it's a World Heritage site, uh, the Cradle of Humankind region. And so we got permission to remove the block. My dad took it back to his lab and they identified it as a hominid fossil. And so about 10 days or so later, my dad returned to the site with every type of ologist you could think of, paleontologist, paleoanthropologist, geologist, anything uh, and everyone with an ologist in their name returned to the site because they thought if a nine-year-old can find a hominid fossil, one of the rarest sought after objects on earth in a minute and a half, anyone can do it. <laughs> so they got to the site and started looking around and it got to about midday and they hadn't found a single thing. This was quite sad because obviously they thought this uh, block had come from the site. So they thought they were going to find at least another partial skeleton related to this block. And so they broke for life and my dad was standing over this hole, looking down into it, uh, wondering what he was going to do next because he was really hating the idea that he was going to have to take this block and place it into one of the other hundred caves up the hill. Because about a hundred years earlier, miners had come through the region uh, looking for limestone. And so they had blown out pieces of uh, caves here and there and taken 
rocks on ox wagons down to the road and to kilns. And so um, my dad was dreading the fact that maybe one of this rock, which was lying off the site, had fallen off an ox wagon and wasn't actually from the site, was, one, was from one of the other 100 cave sites up the hill. Yeah, my dad was dreading the fact he was going to have to take it and place it into one of these. And as he was doing, uh, looking down into the hole, the light shone perfectly through the trees above the hole at the perfect time of day that it lit up the back side of the cave um, and sticking out the wall of the cave was a hominid scapula. My dad looked in shock how they had missed this. And so he got down into the hole. And as he went to go take a closer look, he put his hand up onto the wall to stabilize himself as he took a closer look and out fell two hominid teeth directly into his hand. He then said something because this doesn't happen. No, I bet it doesn't. Oh my God. Uh, something doesn't happen every day to any paleoanthropology uh, uh, professor, I would imagine. Yeah, no, this is a, a lot of paleoanthropologists go their whole career without finding a single hominid fossil. And here we have a partial skeleton and more. And this discovery happened not long after a prominent scientist said that there were no more hominid finds to be made. Uh, but you, you proved them wrong, Matthew, didn't you? In about 2001, um, one of the top uh, paleoanthropologists in the field um, from the US released an article saying that the age of exploration for hominid fossils in Africa is over and there's nothing left to discover we found it all and that's that. This obviously killed the industry of paleoanthropology and killed funding to exploration, just killed it completely and this caused a lot of um, up and coming paleoanthropologists to drop out and change career paths because if one of the top scientists in the field says that there's nothing left to discover, you're going to believe him because obviously he's the expert. He knows best. Um, luckily, it's a very strange thing to say, though, isn't it? It's not very scientific. Not very scientific. And yeah, there's a lot of controversy uh, behind that article and that statement that he released. But um, luckily, my dad did stick in the um, field of paleontology and he kept exploring because that's what he loved. That's what he loved doing. And so um, he kept doing that. And about seven years later, it paid off. Wow. Now, Finding a brand new species of Australopithecus is astounding enough, but a mere five years later in 2013, your dad was presenting a new species of the genus Homo to the world. Uh, this of course was Homo naledi, found deep in the claustrophobic Rising Star Cave, also in South Africa. So what a lot of people don't know, Matthew, is that you were the first person to take scientific photos of these fossils. But let's just go back to the beginning when these bones were first brought to the attention of your father. So how did this all happen? Yeah, so as you said, it was about five years later in 2013. My dad, we had kind of gone to a standstill point um, with the Sediba discovery because we removed enough fossils that we were doing research on them and we were um, excavating the site. So there was kind of not that much that really had to be done um, at that exact point. Obviously, there was still a lot of science being done, but we were at a standstill compared to what we were. And my dad came across the idea that he hadn't actually been out exploring any, uh, any of the rest of the cradle of humankind uh, since I had said, Dad, I found a fossil. Um, and he obviously loved exploring and wanted to keep exploring. And um, he knew that there had to be other stuff out there because if we had just found this um, in one of the most explored regions for um, hominid fossils, then there must be other stuff out there. And so just at about that time, a guy named Pedro Boschaf walked into my dad's office. Um, he had come back from North Africa. He was diamond hunting in North Africa. And he'd come back down to South Africa uh, because he wanted to start up his caving career again and uh, go back into that. So he came to my dad's office asking basically for a job or to help him out somewhere. And my dad said, well, you've come at the perfect time. I want you to go caving. One thing that was lucky is Pedro was actually an ex-caving buddy of my dad's back in the early 90s. And so that's how they knew each other. And so at this time, my dad was like, okay, I want you to go out and explore. Um, go through all the caves in the cradle of humankind. Go through all the caves we know of and see what you can find. Because my dad... Uh, knew that the Malapa site was only about a kilometer over the hill from where my dad had worked for 17 years um, previously. So he knew these fossils were right under our noses. They're right next to us. So they must be in areas we've explored before. 
So Pedro obviously was very excited and went off and he soon found out that he wasn't very physically appropriate for um, squeezing and climbing through tight caves. So he went to his caving club that he's a part of and got two amateur cavers, Steve and Rick, Steve Tucker and Rick Hunter. He employed them and said, okay, uh, Lee Berger wants us to do this. Let's go do that. So they basically got a list of all the caves in the region and started going through them looking for fossils. Obviously, as young amateur cavers, they started with the one they knew the least, uh, best, because obviously that's where the stuff is going to be. But they ended up finding absolutely nothing. They started ticking off cave after cave after cave, nothing, 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 nothing. They basically got to one more cave on their list, which was the Rising Star Cave. And this was the cave they actually knew the best, because every amateur caver in Southern Africa has trained in this cave, because it's got the best turnarounds, upside downs, loops, squeezes, crawls, climbs, every, everything you can think of is in this cave. And so every amateur caver trains in there and just goes on fun caving expeditions in there. So they went to this one last and they thought, okay, well, we may as well go in it to tick it off our list, but it's just going to be another fun caving expedition, nothing to find here because we know this cave. So they went in and they got to the very back of the cave and just before they were about to turn around, uh, they noticed a small, you could call it a crack, a 13-inch hole going down the back of the cave, which they hadn't noticed before. This was unusual, but they were like, okay, cool, a new area in the cave we haven't been, let's go. So they started squeezing their way down this 13-inch crack and got to the bottom and noticed what looked like kind of what my dad had told them to look for, fossils, bones, things on the ground. So they were like, okay, cool. So they took pictures on a GoPro camera brought them out of the cave and came straight to our house. Uh, my dad opened the door for them and we plugged the GoPro into the computer and up popped these images of hominid fossils. My dad's jaw dropped completely. He couldn't believe what he was staring at. And so he knew, okay, this is gonna be another huge discovery. One thing he did notice in the photos was some of them looked like they had been almost stepped on, crushed in a sense, because they were little white flakes of bones. And Rick and Steve had assured my dad that they hadn't stood on those. That's how they were when they entered the cave. So my dad knew that someone or something had been in this cave and obviously either missed them or not noticed them or something and damaged them. So my dad had to act fast to get in there and preserve the fossils. So he called up National Geographic that night and um, basically told them he's got this huge discovery. Um, he wants to start an expedition uh, and he needs funding. They said, yes, go ahead, do whatever you need to do, go for it. He hung up the phone and then he kind of got cold feet because he realized he just promised National Geographic this, another huge hominid discovery of some pretty bad quality GoPro photos. So he knew he had to reassure himself before he started an expedition that these were actually hominid fossils and what he thought they were. And so he knew he was never going to get in there because he also wasn't physically appropriate to get through a 13 inch crack. And he also didn't want to blow open the crack because that could risk of uh, collapsing the cave or other things going wrong. So yeah. he needed someone he trusted uh, and someone who could fit into this and someone who could take scientific photos. And so he came to me. I was 15 years old at the time. And um, luckily I've got a skinny physique, so I am able to fit into those spaces. And so he said, hey, you want to go caving? So. I was hugely up for adventure, so I said, yeah, of course I do. So we returned to the uh, Rising Star Cave with Rick and Steve and some of the other cavers from the club, and we did the whole squeeze and crawl and climb to the back of this cave. And my dad can actually make it to the um, top of this crack. We call the crack the chute. And my dad can actually make it through things like Superman's crawl, which is a crawl where you have to extend your arm forward and put your arm back and squeeze through like Superman and different stuff like that. So my dad can make it past there, but he can't make it down the chute. And so we got to the chute and down I went with Rick and Steve. And as I got to the bottom, I kind of froze because I knew exactly what I was looking at. I was looking at hominid fossils. They were littering the floor everywhere. Everywhere you stood, everywhere you looked, there was a hominid fossil. Wow. I actually couldn't take any photos for about a minute and a half, two minutes because I was shaking so much because I knew, um, especially from the first discovery of Sediba, the significance of hominids and what this will turn into. So I spent about 45 minutes down there taking these scientific photos, different measurement photos of skulls, of mandibles, of femurs, tibias, every type of bone you could think of, I took a picture of. And 
brought these photos up to my dad and we all celebrated because this was exactly what we thought it was. And so about a week after that, my dad put out a Facebook uh, notification uh, to all his colleagues and friends saying, hey, I'm gonna start a um, expedition in South Africa. I need people who are phys uh, physically appropriate to fit into the cave, can work as a team, can aren't claustrophobic, have caving experience, all these different requirements. And they also had to have either a PhD or a master. So they had to be pretty skilled as well. Um, but he didn't actually tell them what they were going to do. He just said, trust me, it's something big. And he also wasn't going to pay them. All um, expenses are going to be paid for, but they're not going to be paid during the expeditions. It was quite risky for someone to accept because you didn't know what you were getting yourself into. But luckily with my dad's reputation from the Sadiba discovery, he was trustworthy enough to get people to <laughs> come. And so after <clears throat> putting this out, he thought maybe there was only going to be one or two people in the whole world who were actually qualified and had all these characteristics and requirements to do this. Um, about a week after that, he got around 60 applicants, all applicants that were able to fit the job. And so um, he narrowed this down to a few uh, women and we nicknamed them the underground astronauts who then came out for a expedition which we did about a month after that um, we did a month-long expedition called the rising star expedition which is actually still up on the national geographic side if you want to go look at that and um, we ended up removing one and a half thousand fossils from the chamber just in that expedition and is that the most that's ever been found for a single find yeah so it it so the sadiba discovery when i first made that turned into the richest hominid uh, discovery in the world and then the Niledi uh, discovery yeah. that took that um, as the richest. So um, just in that first expedition alone, we removed one and a half thousand. And since then, we've had multiple other expeditions and removed thousands of more bones. And there's still thousands down there. Gosh, um, the find is incredible enough, but it still leaves us with so many questions. And for me, the main head scratcher is, why were those bones down there in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. so there, there's a lot of questions that still remain unanswered and some we've got some theories on, like the one, how did they get down there? Obviously, we have our theory. It's still a theory because we can't go back in time and see or ask them why they were doing this. But we've gone through every kind of explanation we can logically think of as to why they will be down there. Um, and our main explanation is that they were purposely taking these bodies down there almost in a ritualized burial, funeral sort of way. Um, this is very unique because before that, we thought humans were the only species to actually do a kind of funeral ritualized burial uh, scenario. Because that's- You mean like Homo sapiens or possibly uh, Neanderthals? Uh, Homo sapiens, possibly Neanderthals, but um, specifically um, Homo sapiens were the, um, we, we thought that was a main characteristic to us was actually taking and mourning our dead and putting them in specific areas to be buried. Because stuff like tool making, um, which a couple years ago we thought we were the only ones to do on the planet, that quickly went away when people like Jane Goodall started seeing chimps use sticks as tools and mm -hmm. birds using tools and all this stuff. So that quickly went away as a characteristic that was unique to us. And so we kind of stuck with the idea that the one thing no other animal does is bury their dead and mourn their dead like we do. And that was disproved when we found a lady because we think that they may have been purposely taking these fossils down because a reason we came to that conclusion is these uh, hominid lady fossils are the only fossils in the chamber. There's no other animal fossils or bones in this chamber. So it can't be something like a carnival killed them and then brought them down here. Mm. It can't be any other explanation you think of because they're the only fossils in here. So they had to have been brought in here specifically and at multiple occasions. We can also tell uh, from doing the science on them that they weren't all brought in at once. They were brought in over multiple stages of life. And so they were coming back and forth doing this. And so that's why we come with the conclusion that it is ritualized burial. And uh, just to be clear, how old has this species been dated? So, like, how, how long before Homo sapiens did they yeah, exist? Yeah, so this, this um, species was very unique in itself. We sent a couple um, fossils off to be dated by multiple um, different labs around the world, all um, by themselves. They had no communication with each other, and they all came back with a date 
ranging around 250,000 years old. This was unbelievable because they shouldn't have been around then. They shouldn't be this young. They should be close to the million mark. They should nowhere be near 250,000 years old. This is also is quite strange because this starts to go into when Neanderthals were starting to arrive. And so what we thought about stuff like stone tool making, where we thought Neanderthals were the only ones capable of doing that with a brain that size to actually make stone tools. And obviously these stone tools being dated to around 250,000 years old were, had to have been Neanderthals because nothing else was capable of doing that at the time. Now that Naledi is there, we're kind of thinking different and we kind of have to scrap all our books that say Neanderthals are the ones making these because how do we know? How do we know there's not another species out there that we haven't found yet that's, that's what it. making these? So it was a very unique date. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there are still bones down there in the Denaledi chamber. So are you still excavating? Is there still work going on even today? Yeah, yeah. So there's still thousands of bones uh, or fossils uh, in this chamber um, and expeditions are going on every so often. We actually have an expedition coming up pretty soon, uh, which I'll hopefully be involved in, but we only take out a few, uh, a few, I say a few hundred fossils at a time right now, because we already have so many that we know what we're working with and we have enough to work with on the surface and do the science behind that we don't need to remove all of them. We also want to leave a lot um, of fossils in the chamber for future generations, for future technology to work on, to do. And so we create as minimal disturbance as possible. And so, yeah, there are still expeditions happening. There are still people going in and out of the cave every so often, but it is now to, uh, specific to you have to have permission to enter. There's obviously yeah. gates set up in the cave, so not just anyone can go in and um, when we have specific expeditions, we'll remove some fossils, do the science on them, and then go from there. But there are still thousands. As I said, the floor is littered. It's literally layer on layer on layer on layer of fossils. Wow. Well, it's really impressive, though, that you know you and your team have decided, okay, we're going to look at this, but we're going to think of future scientists. We're not going to just take them all and hide them away. The, um, you sort of keep you you presenting them to the world, and the, and you're saying to the world, these are yours. Yeah. Um, one thing that is very nice especially that my dad has done and he likes to do with his um career and promote um to his colleagues is he loves the idea of open access and giving everyone the chance to know and learn and study about these because what paleoanthropology was before it was a career where once you made a discovery it was your discovery and you didn't really give too much out to anyone um People had to pay to do this and that. And it was a very nasty field, you could call it. Um, but what my dad is trying to promote is the open access idea. So he put, publishes all his papers for free so that there's free access to these papers online um, so that you can learn about it. If someone wants to come and look at the fossils to study uh, them, if there's an up and coming paleontologist from anywhere around the world that um, wants to come and look at them, my dad is happy to let them uh, have a go. and. So that's one thing that we are trying to promote is the open access and accessibility of fossils so that you aren't being selfish and keeping it all to yourself, but you're letting the world see because this isn't just our, this isn't my history, this isn't his history, it's our history, it's the world's history, so. Yeah, I mean, Sadiba and Naledi, they, uh, they may or may not be direct, you know, uh, lineage to us, but we're all related, we're cousins, aren't we? So it is, like you say, it's our history. Yeah, we're all linked um, in the family tree, the evolutionary tree, uh, one way or another. So um, us finding this doesn't mean it's ours, it's everyone's, it's owned by the world. So we want everyone to enjoy it, everyone to have access to it, and everyone to feel like we aren't keeping it to ourselves and that they can have a piece of our Earth's history. Oh, that's really great. And uh, so you've been on uh, quite a few docu documentaries now, especially when you were younger. You were recently interviewed for BBC World Service Radio. So was it exciting for you to be in the spotlight as a child or were you teased at school or how was it? Yeah, um, it was extremely fun to be in the spotlight. I mean, I had my 10 seconds of fame, um, luckily. But um, yeah, it was very cool. Um, I was very fortunate enough to avoid a lot of the bullying aspect of it. Um, Obviously, you are going to get the people who are jealous and the kids who are jealous that there's the attention on you or the spotlight on you or someone's asking you instead of them, this type of stuff. So 
there was the um, every once in a while teasing and I guess you could call it bullying, but nothing that really affected me. That's one thing that I was very fortunate about. And a lot of my friends that I had and have at the, um, have now were, were and are very supportive of it and supportive of what is happening. And so there's not a very, um, there's not very much hate or jealousy towards it now. And so everyone's really supportive. It was obviously very cool to have some attention and, but it was also a little weird at times because you'd have like the National Geographic camera come follow you around at school for a day or stuff like that. So that obviously brought a lot of attention from uh, people in my school who didn't really know too much about me and stuff like that. But um, overall, I was very fortunate enough to avoid the main bullying sense and everyone was very supportive and still are very supportive of what is happening and where I'm going. Okay, Matthew, that was really fascinating. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk about your studies and your discoveries. You'll no doubt be heading back to university soon, uh, which leaves me with a question. As you're studying anthropology and geology, do you think that you may one day be working, I don't know, in an official capacity with your dad? Yeah, um, so yeah, I am studying anthropology, geology, um, and looking definitely to head into a career um, in one of those fields. Um, I'm not 100% sure exactly which subfield I'll go into or what career I'll exactly go into, but it is something along the lines of that. And I'm pretty positive there'll be a future collaboration between me and my dad or his uh, team uh, with whatever, whether it be the forensic side or paleontology or whichever path I go. But I'm pretty sure there'll be some collaboration somewhere along the way. Excellent. Well, Matthew, thank you very much indeed. And who knows, maybe we'll catch up with you again uh, later in the year or in the near future. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for having me.